Price. That's the number one technical indicator. You do best by investing for the longer term. If you can't explain what the business is doing, then that is a huge red flag. Some technological change is going to put you out of business. It really is a genuinely extraordinary situation. Hello everyone, I'm Ed Gotham and welcome to Opto Sessions where we interview the top traders and investors from around the world uncovering the secrets to their success. Today I welcome David Mazza, the Managing Director and Head of Product at Direction, a well-known provider of ETFs and mutual funds. As Head of Product, David leads the research and development of new products at Direction in addition to the ongoing product management and strategy for the firm. Direction have recently been highlighted as an innovator in the realm of thematic ETFs, and this is exactly what we'll be discussing today. You'll hear about Moon, the latest Moonshot Innovators ETF, as well as the popular Work From Home and Connected Consumer ETFs, leveraging trends such as remote healthcare, streaming platforms, and cyber security. Enjoy. Hi, Dave. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Very good. Uh, it's been an interesting couple of weeks, of course, with the election and everything, and markets have been um, moving around very, very uh, rapidly in, in both directions. Now, Direction, is that, is that Direction? Is that the right way you pronounce it? Correct, yes. Yes. Um, it's been quite an innovator in, in, in the area of thematic ETFs. It's come on the scene and become more prominent uh, over the last three years, a lot more prominent. Is thematic trading and investing in the future it's something that you... You know, thematic ETFs is something that they're specializing in a direction. Do you think that's uh, the future of trading? I, I really do, in particular, when it comes to the, the, the future of ETFs. And here's why. So we, we know investors, and in particular traders, uh, are always looking for new opportunities. And thematic ETFs, thematic investing at its core, is about identifying and trying to capture effectively long-term trends whether those trends are more folks working from home, whether those trends are telemedicine, whether those trends are something in the biotech space, uh, or even um, uh, other ideas that maybe we haven't even thought of yet. Uh, you know, as we know, uh, traders and investors um, have a lot of choices uh, in this day and age, but um, thematic ETFs are really a great way of capturing uh, a long-term trend in a, in a cost-effective, efficient way. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Would you say um, it seems like the old sort of Wall Street still hasn't moved completely away from sectors yet? But would you say uh, like thematic trading is replacing sectors basically, and this more niche markets is easier? Well, in this day and age as well, like the amount of companies that are on the stock market, it wasn't possible before, and this is sort of eventually will sort of replace sectors in a way. Yeah, no, uh, that's a really good point. I think uh, one way I think about uh, themes, and uh, which is I think what you're alluding to, is that they're, they're sort of the new sectors, mm -hmm. right? And it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, investors or traders shouldn't look at broad sectors like financials or energy or, or even tech. But what you're really probably trying to do is capture something uh, underlying there, especially in the tech space, um, because... Uh, just buying, even 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 purchasing uh, uh, an ETF based off of the Nasdaq, you know, which we assume is most people assume is all tech, is not. Uh, and in fact, what you're really probably trying to do is get access to some level of disruption uh, or some level of um, companies that are offering uh, technologies or services that are transform transforming the way the world works. And you're not really going to get that with just a broad-based um, tech ETF, for example. So nothing wrong with that. I just think the precision that you can get with uh, thematic ETS is much greater. Do you see it getting even, it seems as you've got China's uh, stock market is expanding as well, as more and more companies available there. Um, and it seems like all the time we're seeing new themes enter in the US markets as well. I mean, there's a, we'll talk about it later, but you've just released a new um, thematic ETF moon, I believe it's called. Yes. Which is quite an interesting one, largely about dis disruptive founders. And is that the sort of an R&D uh, investment? Is that the right? Yeah, the, the, the new, our, our newest ETF uh, is the ticker is Moon, uh, and it's the direction Moonshot uh, 
Moonshot uh, Innovators ETFs, and it's really th they are focused on 50 early stage companies. So these are small and mid cap companies that uh, they're the 50 stocks are equal weighted at a semi annual rebalance. But the way we identify these are uh, is really interesting. It's looking at a combination of whether companies, as part of their corporate culture, talk about innovation and use words specific to their industry that uh, are focused on innovation relative to their peers. But, so are, but are they also spending money on research and development relative to um, uh, their sales, mm. right? So it's one thing to be talking about innovation, but are you actually doing it? So this basket identifies these, these 50 stocks. Uh, and you know, right now, it has pretty heavy exposure to uh, electronic vehicles, autonomous vehicle, uh, and uh, on one end, and then also some cyber security and biotech on the other end. But that will change through time. Um, so we've, we're really excited about uh, the Moon ETF uh, because it's, it, it really it stretches thematic ETFs uh, in a different way, meaning it's not just about um, one theme, it's about trying to identify emerging themes before they uh, even uh, really come to, to be much, have much broader appreciation across the market. Yeah. No, that's really, uh, really interesting on that one. I, I, I like the uh, construction of it. And if we could just um, wind back a bit and just uh, get a bit of insight into your career today, because it's been quite an interesting one and you've been uh, a few big companies, got a lot of interesting experience is it possible to go into detail on that and also moving into what your role covers now as well? Yeah, sure. So uh, most of my, uh, my career uh, started at State Street Global Advisors. Uh, I worked in a few different capacities there, um, uh, both uh, on an, started on an investment team that manages money for endowments and foundations, um, uh, primarily uh, US-based clients, then moved to uh, a quantitative portfolio management team as an analyst. Uh, and that was an interesting role uh, because we had you know, clients from around the globe and building um, portfolios and solutions for them. But most of my time actually, uh, and my career really transformed when I joined the Spider ETF business. I think most people know State Street listed the first ETF in the US and you know has a, a large global presence with use its ETFs in Europe and then locally listed products in Asia as well. Uh, and uh, my my last role there was focused on re uh, re research and strategy uh, for, uh, for the ETF business. I then transitioned uh, to move to Oppenheimer Funds uh, as they were looking to build out an ETF business. And I, and I, changed, I changed my focus there. Primarily, uh, I was focused on sales and marketing. And then more recently, I've, I've joined Direction. Direction is a really unique firm uh, at large and in the ETF space because primarily uh, its business was historically focused on creating uh, leverage and inverse ETFs really for tactical traders. Um, so folks who are looking to uh, to trade on an intraday or 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 high, you know on a daily basis. Uh, and my role here is as head of product. So I'm responsible for um, you know setting the overall product strategy and uh, doing research and development on new ideas, whether those ideas are solutions and ETFs for tactical traders or increasingly, thematic ETFs that fit around that. So I think when I think about trading, you, you, you can think about uh, your time horizon, right? So uh, leveraging inverse ETFs really on a daily basis uh, or very, very short term. Um, then thematics can, can, can go months or even years uh, to complement other positions in portfolios as those, as those themes change or emerge. Uh, so uh, our business is geared toward more of an active investor uh, more of an informed investor, whether they're uh, retail or or even a hedge fund, uh, but uh, it's uh, giving people the tools that they that they need to uh, uh, deliver outcomes that they're trying to meet in their portfolios. Oh, very interesting. And if you could possibly describe, so how is Direction's mission different to what is Direction's mission, and how how is it different to the other firms you've been uh, you've worked at previously? Well, one one big difference is is uh, is our size. Uh, we uh, we're not a tiny asset manager. You know, about fifteen sixteen billion dollars USD in assets under management. Um, but we we have uh, a small number of people. So what that means is that we can be very nimble and very focused uh, at the same time. Uh, 
you know, there is a lot of benefits to working at larger organizations, um, the reach and breadth uh, and the resources, um, but sometimes they may not be able to move as quickly. Um, so for example, we were able to launch the direction work from home ETF, uh, the ticker is WFH, uh, very, very quickly uh, this, uh, this earlier this year, uh, because we had been kind of ongoing thinking about a theme like remote work, uh, but because you know we don't have layers and layers of committees and any and any red tape, we're just able to put that out on the market. Uh, you know, still construct it effectively, still do all the research, but just move as quickly as we need to. Uh, and and that's really what our what our intention is uh, to 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 be focused on creating products, whether they're being used by tactical traders or being used thematically, um, that help people you know meet the needs that they're looking for uh, when it comes to uh, uh, trading and investing. And I'd, I'd like to dig into um, the ETFs now, because I know you've got um, mutual funds and other, other sort of aspects of the business as well, but in particular, ETFs are interesting to our audience of thinking. There's, um, there's a few different types you have. Is, are you possible, is it possible, you, you sort of touched them already, but is it possible just to describe what types of ETF uh, you offer at Direction um, and who they're most suited for, the different sort of areas? Yeah, it's a, it, it's a, it's a good point. Uh, so uh, we have, yeah, we have some mutual funds. We, uh, we, we have, uh, of course, we have where I think we're best known for ETFs. And we're really probably best known for our leverage and inverse ETFs. So, but what is, what is that uh, for those who might not be familiar? Uh, really, those, are, those ETFs intend to amplify exposures. So uh, meaning uh, the bull fund would be two times or three times its underlying index, whether that's the you know, S&P 500 or gold mining stocks. And then the bear funds are intend to offer inverse exposure. So that's two times or three times uh, the performance of the underlying index. But it's important to remember that exposure is intended to be, is uh, structured and intended to be used on a daily basis. So we reset the exposure to, to be the two times or three times every night. So these are not uh, effective long-term, uh, medium or long-term uh, tools. Um, they're really being used for someone who takes, uh, is an in, uh, informed investor, takes an active position in their portfolio uh, to try to um, uh, uh, outperform based off of their particular opinions. Uh, and oftentimes we offer bull and bear type products so people can, can take those, um, take their, their views into account. Uh, then we also increasingly have been focused on developing and creating more traditional ETFs, but not traditional beta passive exposures where we're, you know, taking S&P 500 or FTSE 100 and just uh, delivering that. It's taking, uh, trying to identify long-term trends that are occurring that uh, we can create a, a relatively concentrated portfolio of exposure, uh, portfolio of stocks to deliver that exposure. So, uh, for example, the work from home ETF has 40, only 40 stocks in it. Uh, and again, they're equally weighted. Uh, in that particular fund, uh, you're going to have exposure to Google and you're going to have exposure to Amazon because I uh, Microsoft because they're the biggest cloud um, cloud companies. But I don't, we don't want them to dominate exposure. I want smaller names uh, like Twilio. Uh, and uh, up until recently, even a Zoom video to be driving the performance of that, mm. of that fund. It's really important when it comes to thematic ETFs for investors to know what they own and understand why those names are in the portfolio. Uh, now, Moon, which I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, there's going to be a lot of names that you are not familiar with in that portfolio, uh, but that's the intention uh, because it is focused primarily on small and mid cap names that are being truly transformative and truly innovative. Uh, so there's some household names in there, but there's a lot of names that are really at the cutting edge uh, and are only beginning to be uh, kind of broadly captured. So for, again, for direction, uh, wide range of ETFs, but primarily focused on leveraging inverse ETFs uh, and, then th and then thematic ETFs. Yeah, very interesting. And um, you've mentioned it already, the work from home ETF. Uh, I believe is your most successful thematic ETF to date. Um, yes. Is it possible just to go into detail on the ETF and the like, investment objective behind it? Yeah, of course. So yeah, the work from home ETF, uh, it's, uh, we launched it in, in June of this year, um, but it's, it's a little under 150 million USD right now uh, as uh, investors 
have embraced uh, the long-term thesis of remote work. Now, certainly the pandemic has accelerated more people working from home. Uh, but if you, if you take a step back, uh, there's been underlying, an un, a kind of a slow drumbeat of more companies embracing remote or hybrid working models. Uh, because what companies are finding is actually for certain roles, it can be very effective to have people spending some time in the office and some time at home. The, again, COVID, the COVID's only going to accelerate those trends. Um, and and it's, it's not an either or situation. You know, we've ended up in this interesting juncture in the markets where it's either reopening stocks doing one uh, great one day. So there's your airlines and cruise, cruise, cruise lines, and then it's your stay at home stocks. For me, I don't actually want a theme. I, I, I don't want to invest in something that's only going to last for a few months. Um, certainly it could be a trade there. Uh, but Remote work uh, is all about uh, this kind of longer term trend. So what we did is we took four pillars uh, that are helping companies and employees with remote work. So that is cloud, cloud technologies. So how are we storing our data? Cybersecurity, how are we keeping that data that uh, workers are, are capturing and using in disparate locations safe? Uh, that's at your highest level. Then the other two pillars are remote communication, so how are we spending time communicating with our peers, and then uh, online project and document management companies. So what we do is we partner with Selective, they're an index provider, and they actually have a, uh, something which is called, uh, a tool called Artis, which is focused on natural language processing. So we don't actually build the ETF uh, solely based off of a, a company's revenue. Because some companies aren't, um, that you want to have exposure to might not be reporting, well, how much revenue do we make from companies that are uh, doing work from home versus not. We use this uh, natural language processing tool to uh, read financial statements, to read uh, other documents, whether they're analyst reports, respected blog posts, uh, financial media, et cetera, to help identify those companies. So the 10 stocks that are most representative of those four sub themes make their way in the portfolio 40 stocks total uh and that's why we think it's a you know a relatively concentrated portfolio but it is diverse it's intended to be uh meaning you know one name isn't going to subsume the portfolio and you know again investors uh continue to to embrace this this fund even uh as um the uh uh, positive news about the vaccine uh, comes out because um, there's a lot of opportunities in long-term disruption uh, and these companies are really at the forefront yeah. of that. That's been really interesting how it's the COVID sort of situation is, is fast forwarded something that you know potentially was going to happen anyway at some point in time but you know with some firms resistant to it it's taken a while to get there previously. Correct. And do, why, in your mind, do you think this is not just because, you, you know, there's a lot of chat on the Internet uh, or on TV and everywhere about whether or not this is a disruptive trend uh, or a fad? And, you know, I know you've talked about this before. And what, why do you think it's not a fad? Well, one of the reasons why I think it's not a fad is because we uh, the product, the productivity is there. Right. So if if we learned if corporations were reporting uh you know, especially large multinationals that having more people at home was impacting their ability to effectively run their business. Uh, we would have heard that, uh, but we're not hearing that. In fact, we're actually hearing more and more companies, um, many of them tech or tech enabled, say, we're going to go fully remote because we just don't need uh, that much physical office space, or we're going to have a hybrid model. And by a hybrid model, I mean, uh, sometimes people work at home or work anywhere, and sometimes they work in the office. I actually think the hybrid model is which most exciting because you don't actually need to be sit next to someone to do most of your work. Now, if you're working in a factory and other things, certainly, but for service-based roles, there is a requirement and a need, though, for collaboration. So maybe sometimes we go into the office uh, and we do our brainstorming sessions. Then we go off on our own uh, and actually get the work done and come back together. Uh, plus, if you actually uh, look at surveys, whether they're um, uh, focused uh, at the CFO level again, so this is you know global CFOs, or more importantly, 
what millennials and Gen Z are saying about their preferences for work, their preferences are hybrid working models. Uh, older generations, part of, partially because of just what they've only known, and some of them aren't as comfortable with technology, they actually prefer working in an office. Younger generations prefer the hybrid approach. So for companies who want to uh, be able to recruit effectively and build effective teams are going to need to be offering um, these benefits uh, to folks. So again, because I think this confluence of events that the, um, that the pandemic has actually brought to the forefront, these uh, both the top line coming from corporations and the bottom line coming from employees are going to come together to make remote work uh, much more of a long-term theme that I think people are appreciating right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could argue it's just the start of it. Correct. Really. Because there are so many other things that are required now that people probably wouldn't have thought of before um, and demand for different software, et cetera, outside of what's available now probably exists. Well, that's a big, Sorry, I just add one thing. That's really a big, a big part of this. Um, in fact, there was an interview uh, that's kind of been floating around on Twitter and and on the internet with Steve Jobs from 1990, right? And Steve Jobs, you know, visionary. Uh, uh, and I think we we are most focused, of course, on uh, the products he built, um, whether it's the Mac or the iPhone or the iPod. Uh, but it's he he was talking about. Uh, and almost predicting remote work because of technology and because of uh, the cost effectiveness of it, right? So even in, even in 2008, uh, of course, uh, when we think about um, that was disruptive from a financial markets point of view, it wasn't possible. Internet speeds weren't fast enough. The data that we require couldn't support this. So because now we have such cheap and effective internet, not everywhere, but in many places, you can do this. And because companies have created uh, either the security features or they continue to be focused on that, it's much safer to actually have, um, to be removing the, uh, much of the barriers that uh, we, you know, whether it's paper-based models or things like that, um, that, you know, again, it's really just the start now. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's, it's gonna continue going forward. Yeah. No, I definitely agree. It's definitely a, a shift happening that we'll see, yeah, see will, will, will happen for years to come as well. And um, sl slightly uh, related, but not directly, but um, what do you think is going to happen to the cities if, if they're, we're, we're, we're hearing stories about New York has been sort of an exodus due to COVID because it's, you know, places that have been such high rents, but now we don't have to, the employees, et cetera, don't have to live there. They've been moving outside. Do you think that's, going to be a new way of working or, or do you think cities will go back to the way they were well i do i do feel for cities i'm a resident of new york city but what i what what i can tell you is often like like uh you know the environment we find ourselves in things get sensationalized right right so there certainly will be will be people uh more people probably accelerating their moves um but again i don't see the the death of cities because again uh this isn't an either or, and that's uh, where we need to, to take a step back from. There's still going to be a need for offices. Maybe they're not going to be. In fact, there might, even with, with a vaccine, people might want more socially distanced offices. Um, so I don't think that there's just going to be massive death of commercial real estate. It's gonna, in, yeah. in the short term, it, it's probably going to be painful uh, as this transition happens. Uh, but you know, I think cities that are major financial centers uh, – are still going to have a massive draw, uh, especially when we think about um, uh, uh, to for for young folks. Um, you know, New York, San Francisco, London. I could go down the list where people aren't going to want to necessarily live in the woods. Um, yeah, yeah. Right. So uh, it's it's really a mixed uh, mixed bag there. It's almost going to open it up to younger people, maybe because this might be the the older generation might move out who might not you know need to be there as much or something. Uh, and maybe yeah there's a lot more young people around yeah um, and that might actually you know again it, transitions are painful right and in the short term you know it, it's it's going to be probably difficult and we may see some bankruptcies from uh in the residential real estate or the commercial real estate but it, it likely will produce lower rents uh 
so so more younger people uh, who want the dynamicism can, can afford it uh, in ways that yeah. maybe weren't possible before. Mm. And outside of Zoom, um, which you already mentioned, can you take us through some of the your favorite stocks that are currently in the fund? Yeah, of course. I think you know Zoom video is the poster child for the pandemic uh, because uh, it's a technology that a lot of folks weren't using before, and now they're embracing it. Uh, and they're and they're embracing the free service, but but many corporations are um, signing up as corporate customers. You know, Zoom's uh, uh, massive revenue growth year over year, yeah. which uh, may not be repeated, um, but shows you that there's some potential there. Another name I really like is less well known. It's Twilio. Yeah. Twilio is a communications company, and your people use Twilio every day, if the, yeah, even if they don't realize it. So. What they do is they make it very easy for coders um, to basically, historically, they started just for text messages and phone calls. Uh, but when you hear from an Uber or Lyft driver or when you hear from an Airbnb host uh, via text, that's actually being sent with Twilio. Um, so really interesting name. And then, of course, um, you know, there's other uh, exciting names like uh, Ticker Team, uh, which is really about collaboration software. That's, it, they started... Uh, as a corporation focused uh, really on creating tools for developers uh, to to share code and such with one another effectively uh, and efficiently, and now they've you know broadened out uh, into other collaboration tools that can be used at the at the corporate level. So um, you know again, these are uh, exciting stocks because they're they're making the world just better. Um, simply put, um, so those are those are a few of yeah. my favorites in that fund. Oh, great, and um, direction. Moonshot ETF, Moonshot Innovators, so it's lit literally just been released. And we've, yeah, we've yes. about it slightly. Can you just give a quick overview again and maybe highlight a few companies that you think are the most disruptive um, in that selection? Yeah, certainly. So Moonshot Innovators is, uh, is intended to be, again, at the really leading edge of, uh, of long-term disruption. Uh, so it's, it's less focused on one theme. The themes that are in the fund will change over time. And a lot of, again, a lot of companies and investors, you know, think they, they have exposure to innovation uh, and they, and they might. Um, and it doesn't mean Apple, Amazon, Google isn't innovative, but I want to potentially find the next one. So uh, Moonshot Innovators is just that. Uh, it's 50 stocks. Um, they are, uh, have to be U.S. listed, but they can be from around the globe. So U.S. company or ADR. Uh, and what we do to identify those is there we're partnering with s p kensho uh, as our index provider and we're doing two things we're looking at whether companies themselves are talking about innovation in their financial statements in a material way and in a way that's more material than their peers um, but that's just talk uh, we also want to confirm that they are innovative by the fact that they're spending considerable portions uh, of their total revenue on research and development. Uh, so right now, the fund, you know, the largest weight in the fund is NEO. Uh, NEO uh, has seen tremendous returns this year. It's, it's in, uh, known as the Tesla of China, but actually, potentially, they, they might actually be more transformative than Tesla, uh, which is, I know, a bold thing to say. But uh, what they are doing is something called battery as a service. So imagine you go into a uh, uh, a station and as opposed to having to just have your car sit for for minutes or hours to um, to, to have uh, you know uh, to be refilled with electricity if you will we're, they're just swapping out batteries um, so, so that's a really I think a really interesting company then there's another uh, uh, electronic vehicle name in there called Workhorse uh, which has had some pretty excellent returns this year uh, and then uh, a name which is again in a diff, uh, in some ways related, but frankly actually more focused on hydrogen, which which might be uh, the next kind of wave after EV, is uh, is a, a plug power. Um, so again, these um, these are names that some people may some traders may have latched onto because they've been moving, but uh, they really are. Uh, intended to be truly transformative. Some of them might not pan out, um, but a lot of them historically have based off of the research that we've done. And again, it's because we're focused on companies that are at the lower end of the market cap spectrum. I do This portfolio is purposely intended to not have exposure to mega caps or yep. large caps in any way, shape or form. 
And obviously, yeah, one of the other benefits of, of, of ETF is that diversified exposure obviously reduces the risk of, you know, plug power not not um, cut, like making it uh, its potential. And but a few other people in in the index uh, might, and therefore the, it can it can keep going up while some fail. Correct. That, that's a really key point. Is that particularly when you're intending to be at the leading edge of something, and maybe some could argue bleeding, you're taking on a lot of risk. Um, but you know, the whole point is that you want to be compensated for that. So to me, one of the real benefits of Moonshot is you get the 50 names. And after a rebalance, they're all equally weighted. Uh, so uh, each stock, um, whether it is Neo or Virgin Galactic, which is in the portfolio, Plug Power, Fuel Cell, uh, I could go yeah. on, uh, will will meet that objective that long-term objective and that you know uh that's what a moonshot is about right uh it's taking something which uh is uh, a real challenge uh, but can be if if it's met is truly transformative yeah very interesting i'll be, I'll be watching that one closely i think it's uh similar to, to um maybe not in the constituents inside it but i think the arc innovation uh, disruptive innovation etf is sort of along that theme as well and obviously that one's been incredibly popular as well. We hope you're enjoying the episode. For interviews like this every Thursday, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, make sure you give us a star rating and leave guest suggestions along with any other feedback in the review section. Now, back to the show. Connected consumer I wanted to move on to now. This is another really interesting uh, ETF that you offer that's made up of a few areas that are dis- being disrupted. Can you ever give us a brief overview of this one uh, and the different sort of themes inside this connected consumer um, topic? Yeah, connected consumer, uh, I, call, I call it a sibling to work from home because it's also four sub themes and 40 stocks with uh, the, 10, the 10 stocks with the highest relationship to those themes. Connected consumer is embracing the fact, again, that the, the pandemic really only, I think, awakened our eyes to what was already happening in the world. And what was happening in the world is that the way we engage with our friends, with our family, uh, with our health, with uh, the way we entertain ourselves is done more virtually and digitally. So the themes included in this is home entertainment. So you're going to see names uh, on home entertainment uh, that, you know, are streaming services that are uh, e-gaming, e-sports, Things that we do uh, maybe historically would uh, get that content in other ways. We can do that all through devices uh, in, in our home or, or wherever we might be. Uh, in addition, uh, you know, that fund does have uh, social, what we call digital and social interaction companies. So that includes uh, names like social media companies, your Snap and your Facebooks, uh, along with Zoom, because um, that's you know, increasingly how we are communicating with friends and family. But then... Two, two themes which may not be as appreciated, but are really, really important, I think, in the long term. And that's why I, I really like the Connected Consumer ETF. It also has remote health and well-being stocks. So you have Peloton, you have Smile Direct Club, and you have um, other telehealth uh, companies like Teladoc. Because one thing we've, that we've also learned is that you don't need to go to a gym to work out. Uh, you can do it in your home, whether you actually have the bike or you just use the Peloton app to do um, hit classes or yoga classes. In fact, it might be more efficient than schlepping to the gym in your car or, uh, or uh, on the subway, what have you. Uh, also, you don't need to go to a doctor's office to do a lot of visits. Um, I had never used it before. And, you know, again, uh, I used it recently, uh, tele- telehealth that is, and it's, it just makes a lot of sense. And then, Lastly is online education. Online education is huge uh, in areas like Asia. Um, but uh, again, with 90% of students having to go remote during you know, the first wave of the pandemic in March and April, and 90% of students, that's globally. Um, again, people realize, wow, there's actually, uh, you know, there's maybe some struggles to try to teach a, 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 a seventh grader <laughs> remotely, but for high school or for college, for other, or for even for um, upskilling, if you are already, you know, graduated from a college or university, um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of benefits to that too. So that is connected consumers a really exciting fund for the, for those reasons. Yeah, I think you um, in particular that yeah the remote healthcare 
which covers like well two two, two different areas there, the, the sort of telemedicine consultation sort of thing and also um very it, you can see how these are going to grow into more dis, you know, disruptive trends and you know and you've already seen the likes of peloton nautilus etc really sort of rocket um in recent times but i think you know people it's all the opportunity exists when most people don't understand how big of a disruptive change could be and it, it feels as though this could be a lot bigger than people are you know perceiving it to be so the, this, this, the scope for those companies to grow is massive really there's some research you highlighted directions that highlighted some research showing yes so three quarters of existing customers on subscription based uh, streaming platforms because one of the areas in this etf is obviously home, home ent entertainment added additional packages and connected devices during lockdown which is really interesting and shows you how um even people were worried of you know when that netflix was going to lose its status as you know disney came out of their own one i know hbo in the us is bringing out their own streaming platform do you how do you think that space is going to evolve do you think the norm will be, be for people to have multiple platforms which seems to be the case at the moment or will it will something you know over time people will just find their favorites and, and stay with those well it's funny you know we talk about cutting the cord right uh and that just means you know not using your, your your cable service, but now it's all about content, right? So uh, many people, myself and my family included, I have two, I have a wife and two two young girls. Um, you know, we were we we purchased Disney Plus as soon as possible um, because those are their favorite shows. Uh, meaning, you know, the, the 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 Disney movies, primarily princess movies for now, um, but. Uh, we're an Amazon Prime customer and a Netflix customer as well, uh, and potentially might add others. Now, eventually, what it's funny though, that's still more cost effective than what a cable service would be. And we can take those subscriptions with us uh, if we are traveling. Uh, not that we're necessarily doing that now, but uh, if we were staying in a hotel, we could watch them there. Uh, if we were staying at a, 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 another house or something. Um, so the fungibility of that uh, is really, uh, transformative, but over time, uh, you know, there will be winners and losers uh, with that. With that, for sure. Yep. Yep. No, very interesting. That how long? How long has this that ETF been around? Is that one of your earlier ones, or that come out after work from home? Um, the Connected Consumer ETF was launched in August. Um, so this year, you know, we uh, it's, that's still quite new. Um, it's still uh, it's still sub ten million, you know, mil million dollars, uh, but. Uh, its performance has been exceptional. So I really, uh, again, what, it, it was quite obvious, you know, maybe I shouldn't frame it this way, but you know, it's quite obvious a, a company like Zoom would do well during the pandemic. Uh, and maybe to some extent Peloton, because they are a new company and more people uh, who wanted to be healthy purchased their bikes as quick as they could. But what's less obvious is that, the, and you mentioned this a moment ago, just a long-term change that's happening so quickly. And people are embracing, even as uh, we have the great news about uh, uh, strong vaccines and another one came out just today, um, behaviors are gonna change. Uh, and they're gonna change uh, particularly of how we consume uh, and how we entertain ourselves. That's gonna be sticky, um, which is I think one of the reasons why um, the Connect Consumer ETF uh, in fact, might, might even be more interesting than um, simply the, the work from home ETF. Yep, yep. I wanted to move on to now um, the leveraged ETFs. I know, you know, these are the most uh, successful ETFs that you offer, partly because I think these are some of the first that you offered as well. Um, the Daily Technology Bull 3X uh, is, I, I believe, is one of the biggest ones out of your leverage. Yes. Can you sort of describe... Uh, the ETF and you know why why this one is the most popular. So uh, uh, yeah, the technology bull ETF, the ticker is T E C L, uh, is is really popular this year, frankly, because uh, tech, you know, up until the last weeks has had you know exceptional performance and exceptional performance really on a daily basis. So um, what this fund does is it's structured as a, a, a three times exposure to uh, the underlying uh, technology select sector index. So every day um, we uh, either relever or delever the fund to meet that 300% objective. Uh, so traders can use this tool 
to try to um, uh, outperform uh, if they if they believe that you know on a particular day tech, tech is going to to do well, or um, you know you can uh, tech uh, S, which is a smaller fund, but that's the bear fund. Um, so an investor could could take the opposite uh, view, uh, and that's really how folks use our leverage and inverse ETFs. Um, you know whether it's tech L, which is you know quite large in size, or uh, you know other funds uh, like even on the S and P five hundred, which is uh, SPXL, and the bear fund is SPXS, uh, are really you know used to try to play off one each one another. If again, if I believe uh, on this day there's an opportunity for me to uh, outperform by by uh, tilting my portfolio toward tech or or uh, toward another area. Yeah, very interesting. And uh, there's another uh, ETF. I don't believe this is a leverage one. This is another. It's like another strategic uh, allocated one. The Nasdaq 100 equal weighted, because traditionally the Nasdaq 100 is, is market cap weighted, I believe. So this is an equal weighted uh, version of the of the Nasdaq 100. How how do you? Uh, what's the benefit of equally weighted version over the traditional market cap weighted version? Uh, well, well, what's really interesting is. Um, that fund, again, to your point, you know, one of the benefits maybe of the NASDAQ is that it can be, it can be so top heavy. And in fact, this year, uh, uh, the market cap weighted traditional NASDAQ 100 has outperformed. Um, but what this fund does, which again, which is, uh, and maybe is setting up for, uh, uh, if we do see this rotation away from just the mega cap names doing so well, is give me all, give me ever, give me the same stocks. Uh, literally all the same, but we equal weight them. So don't let their market cap determine their size in their portfolio, just simply naively equal weight. And what you find is that uh, in years, uh, although it hasn't been the case this year and it wasn't the case in 2019, um, but if we do see a rotation, uh, a lasting rotation that we're, we're maybe beginning to see here, uh, it will outperform uh, its cap weighted brethren uh, because of that. So we, we like this fund for, you know, for traders or investors to, um, you can really kind of make that view relative to uh, just the NASDAQ 100 um, by, by having that uh, equal weighted exposure should you want to. Yeah, no, I think it's really interesting. Um, I'm surprised I've not seen something like this before. So um, I've, yeah, I'm very interested in that one. I think like, especially at times like now, like it is extremely top heavy. You would think at those extremes that you know there's going to be some mean reversion anyway, so you'll benefit from having something like an equal weighted. And I just wanted to um, also talk about that now we're approaching sort of the end of the interview a bit about your process as, as head of product. Um, you obviously lead the R and D of new products as well. Can you talk about how you discover sort of themes that you're interested in uh, creating a product for? Well, one thing that you know we. It's interesting when you when you're creating thematic ETFs, you really need to be thinking about this, like wh what does tomorrow's world look like today? And that's uh, a kind of a funny thing to say, but the reason I put it that way is that uh, I I want to be thinking about what 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 might five years from now look like, or what what might ten years look like, and where are those lasting? Are there going to be lasting uh, pervasive themes? So um, you know. Two of the most obvious uh, are the fact that rem remote work um, uh, is really only been accelerated by the pandemic and will, will continue to grow, and that um, consumers' um, behavior will change. Uh, it's very obvious online shopping is not necessarily going to go away, and, and other things we spoke about, whether it's telehealth or remote wellness, uh, are, are going to increase in the future. Uh, so that's kind of what the process is. It's less about, you know, can I create the best portfolio that outperformed two years ago? I want to be thinking about the future here. So we are, but I want to be clear, we're still doing a significant amount of research, significant amount of understanding the risk and the environments that funds like this might do well or poorly. And we want to communicate that with uh, the educational material or our website would have you. But to identify the themes, you have to be looking ahead. You can't be looking backward. Yeah. And um, what do you believe is the future of ETF? I mean, we briefly touched on thematic ETFs and, and the, the future of those. We think it's going to just get larger, basically. But ETFs as, as, a, as a sort of product have been hugely successful over the last 10 years. Do you see that 
success sort of increasing uh, and, and, and you know, over the next 10 years, it just getting bigger and bigger? I, 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 yeah, personally, I'm very biased to believe that the ETF mar uh, marketplace and the ecosystem around ETFs, and by that I mean the different, uh, the different types of users, whether they're re particularly retail investors, uh, will continue to drive uh, ETFs as a group larger. Because whether you want to get cost-effective exposure to, um, to, to a broad benchmark like the FTSE 100 or the MSCI All World and you know, get thousands of stocks in one portfolio, um, you can do that with an ETF. Or now that we're seeing the growth of thematic ETFs, um, partially driven by the, the disruptions that, that's occurred this year, you can get, like for in Moonshots, you can get 50 stocks that maybe you've never heard of 40 of them or 45 of them. Um, but I'm not just going to put all of my money in one of them. Uh, I'm going to get exposure to companies that are involved with long-term innovation, doing things that have never been done before. Uh, but I do that cost-effectively with one trade. Yeah, yeah. And um, in terms of uh, themes, that you, is there any you could probably divulge of stuff that you're uh, interested in at the moment, if it's anything that's on your radar, share any sort of potential products coming up, or are they all sort of um, under the radar at the moment? Well, uh, for regulatory reasons, there's certain things we 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 can't discuss. But um, where where I'd say our where our research is really focused on is, you know, looking into uh, after we did a significant amount of work developing moonshot innovators is, are there are there actually some subgroups in here that um, would make some sense to potentially be a separate portfolio, right? If you could. Um, uh, pair them up. What you know? Maybe that's in uh, in the, in biotech or in the or in the medical space. Um, so there's a lot. Of, we're doing a lot of work there. Or are there you know types of uh, we know that renewable energy and, and the like will continue to to likely increase uh, both in the U.S. and 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 particularly in Europe. Are there other broader ways of thinking about renewables that's that's less obvious than just solar? Um, so. You know, that's, that, that's sort of, again, focused on the future, uh, but trying to back into what are the opportunities for investors today? Yeah, I like it. Very interesting. I, I personally think, um, I don't know, as a you know, retail investor, investing in themes is just something that resonates with me quite easily. You can just, it becomes a bit more real um, than investing in the NASDAQ 100 or something. Uh, and, and you've got the potential for disruption is something that, you know, also interests me as well. Um, it's almost like you can become an angel investor, but but not. Uh, yeah, it opens it up to people that um, uh, can't do it in in the private markets. But your, your opportunity to you know dip your turn into it in the public markets. Do you think that um, sort of along the lines of the connected consumer, that there's going to be more and more retail investors interested in the stock market because there's apps or, or ways to access the stock market like never before. It's, it's sort of had a huge amount of success with um, the younger sort of age group in particular in COVID. Um, and it seems like, you know, as the world is expanding, you know, globally overseas, China, et cetera, are going to want to invest in stocks, et cetera, as well. It seems like the ETF world has a lot, you know, a lot longer to grow and it could, get, it could become sizely bigger over the years to come. Yeah. I, I completely agree with that. I, you know, this has been a difficult year uh, for for many folks. Whether you know, whether you've been impacted directly, uh, well, everybody's been impacted in one way, shape, or form with 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 this virus globally. But there there are a few silver linings, and, and one of them to me is that more and more folks, especially younger folks, and, and you know, I'm still relatively young, but but younger than me are interested in the stock market, interested in trading, interested in investing in a way that we haven't seen for years. Now, naysayers you know, will um, often point to them making bad decisions and, and, and doing bad behavior. But if, if you look at the articles and the research that even some academics are doing, turns out, again, this year might not be always the case, but retail investors ha have, done, have done pretty well for themselves. Uh, and if more people can be focused on their finances, and focused on uh, being interested in them uh, along with other interests that they have, I think that's really healthy uh, because you're, you, you 
you don't want to be too spe speculative, of course. Um, you should have you know, some money allocated to long-term, set it and forget it, more boring type investments. Um, but if you, again, have the ability to be focused and be focused on themes, or if you are a really active trader and focused on leverage and inverse, um, you know, because you now can do it much more cost-effectively through apps, um, as opposed to you know, calling up a broker and talking for 15 minutes, uh, getting pitched whatever they're wanting to sell you, or and spending a significant amount of money to do that trade, uh, it's all for the better. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Well, Dave, uh, thank you so much for um, giving us the, the time to have the interview. It's been really interesting actually to talk through some of the products you've got and uh, why you, you created them. Um, and very interesting to a lot of people on the podcast, I think, um, who listen to the podcast. These themes, you know, I agree, are, are really interesting ones uh, to be involved in. Um, is there anything you'd like to say to, to uh, everyone before, before we go? Yeah, the, uh, I just want to yeah, thank everybody for, uh, for their time. Uh, feel free to visit our website, uh, direction.com, for more information on the products, but also educational material. So uh, if you're not familiar with Leverage and Inverse ETFs, re read about them first uh, before you start trading them. Uh, or if you're interested in learning more about, you know, why, why is this particular stock uh, in this particular uh, fund, like Moonshot Innovators, you, you can find that there too. Mm. Um, so, uh, that would be my, uh, uh ask and encouragement of, of everybody, but thank, thanks for having me. That's all right. And you've got a blog on uh, direction that you, you contribute to as well. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So, uh, I, I blog pretty frequently. Uh, in fact, the most recent blog I did was actually, again, in the U S the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics actually has just has been releasing data about remote work. Um, uh, so I actually just wrote a blog about kind of checking in on those trends. You know, there's a lot of survey data, but this is hard data that's beginning to show to what we spoke about, you know, uh, at length earlier that uh, it's showing some stickiness already. Um, so yeah, feel free to check out the blog. Uh, it's called The Spotlight. Excellent. Okay. Thanks very much, Dave. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everyone. Just a quick note before we sign off. If you're looking for an easily digestible daily update on the markets, this might be of interest. Opto Updates is our short newsletter sent every day during the trading week, giving you a bulleted list of the top seven stories from the global stock markets. We've done the hard work for you, highlighting relevant opportunities and trends. And in addition, we'll also keep you notified of any new products, stock reports or webinars from the Opto world. If you're interested, sign up using the link in the show notes. And thanks also to CoFruition for consulting on and producing the show. Until next time.